This is for the Ethics Review class at Parker University. The twelfth rule we're going to talk about is the rule against sexual misconduct. I'll begin with a couple of thoughts about sexual misconduct in general. Woody Allen said sex without love is a meaningless experience, but as far as meaningless experiences go, it's pretty damn good. Now, before you put too much weight in his opinion, Keep in mind that he went through a very nasty divorce over his relationship with a stepdaughter. I think John Barrymore probably got it more accurate. This is Drew Barrymore's grandfather, who was an actor in Hollywood and went through several nasty divorces. He described sex as the thing that takes up the least amount of time and causes the most amount of trouble. And that's really a true statement for chiropractors. A brief indiscretion can cause a tremendous trauma to the doctor and the doctor's license and the doctor's practice. So as we talk about these rules, let's, let's talk first about what conduct is prohibited. Uh, Texas rules provide that engaging in sexual misconduct with a patient within the chiropractic patient relationship is grossly unprofessional conduct and can be subject to discipline. Sexual misconduct includes sexual impropriety and sexual intimacy. And what I want you to understand here is how broad the board's interpretation of sexual misconduct is. Sexual intimacy includes things that I think most people would look at and say that's obviously sexual misconduct. Of course, things like intercourse and genital contact are prohibited. But sexual impropriety includes a lot of things that people may not initially think of as sexual misconduct. The first part of the definition says sexual impropriety includes any behavior, gestures, statements, or expressions which may reasonably be interpreted as inappropriately seductive, sexually suggestive, or sexually demeaning. So think about things like uh, uh, misogynistic jokes or jokes about dumb blondes. Is that sexually demeaning? Uh, certainly it could be. And the problem with jokes like that is you can tell them a hundred times and most people will laugh and not think anything about it. But all it takes is one person to make a complaint to the board in Austin. And it means you're probably going to get to go visit with the board and explain why you made that statement and why you thought it was appropriate. Sexual impropriety also includes inappropriate sexual comments about and to a patient or a former patient, including sexual comments about an individual's body or sexual comments which demonstrate a lack of respect for the patient's privacy. Think carefully about compliments that you make to patients and how you make them. Make them in an appropriate professional manner. Uh, sexual impropriety also includes asking for unnecessary details of sexual history or sexual likes and dislikes from a patient. I can't think of too many situations where that information is necessary for chiropractic treatment. I suppose you could imagine a situation where it become possible possibly relevant, but unless you have a pretty good reason for asking those questions, it's simply not something a chiropractor needs to be getting into. Making a request to date a patient. Think about that one for a minute. Just asking a patient out for a date is sexual misconduct and can be subject to discipline by the state board. Does it make any difference whether the patient says yes or no? Does it make any difference whether the date actually happens or not? Just asking the patient for a date is sexual misconduct. Initiating conversation about the sexual problems, preferences, or fantasies of the doctor. I can't imagine any situation in a professional relationship where that conversation is appropriate. Of course, kissing or fondling of a sexual nature is sexual, and sexual misconduct. And then this last item is a, very much a catch-all clause. Any other deliberate or repeated comments, gestures, or physical acts 
not constituting sexual intimacies, but of a sexual nature. So think about things, stray comments that happen in your office. Something like referring to the person at the front desk as the girl. Uh, refer to them by their name. I think it shows a better relationship or more professionalism when you're dealing with your patients. And it avoids the risk that you may offend patients. You think it's upsetting to refer to people as, as to young women as girls. Um, and also, I want to make sure you understand when the board talks about sexual misconduct, they're not focusing just on physical acts. Certainly, that's a part of it. But they're also talking about things like inappropriate statements, inappropriate conversations, even asking the patient out for a date as being sexual misconduct. That is a very broad interpretation, and I think an appropriate interpretation of sexual misconduct uh, that's not appropriate in a uh, doctor-patient relationship. So let's talk about some of the exceptions or defenses that people think exist. Uh, one possibility that immediately comes to mind is, is if a doctor is interested in a relationship with a patient, is it okay to terminate the doctor-patient relationship and then begin to date the patient? Now, I think these rules vary somewhat from state to state. But the rule in Texas essentially says, first, there needs to be a six-month cooling-off period. The doctor-patient relationship needs to be terminated for at least six months before the relationship occurs. And the second element is the patient must not be emotionally dependent on the doctor when the sexual relationship occurs. How could you possibly prove that? Now, remember when these complaints are filed, no one files these complaints when they're in love and everybody's happy. These complaints get filed when somebody's heart gets broken and they often want a little bit of revenge. What an easy way to get revenge. The doctor terminated the relationship. Yes, the doctor waited six months before asking the patient out for a date, but the patient was still dependent, emotionally dependent on the doctor. And there's a lot of good research out there that says that patients, former patients, will continue to place a special trust in doctors for as long as 10 or 15 years after the doctor-patient relationship has been terminated. So be careful about terminating the doctor-patient relationship so you can date the patient. Just waiting six months by itself is not necessarily going to be enough. What if the patient consented to the relationship? What if the patient asked the doctor out for a date? Does that make it a defense? The rule is very clear in Texas that is never a defense. The whole rationale behind the sexual misconduct rules is that because the doctor-patient relationship requires that the patient or expects that the patient place special trust in the doctor, it's inappropriate for the doctor to take advantage of that trust and the patient really can never consent to that relationship. In a way, it's kind of looking at uh, uh, consensual relationships between adults and minor children. That's obviously against the rules because the minor children cannot effectively consent to the relationship. Same rationale here. Because of the doctor-patient relationship and the imbalance of, of bargaining power, the patient is never in a situation where they can effectively consent to a sexual relationship with a doctor. The last two situations I don't have a clear answer on. What if the sexual relationship started before the doctor-patient relationship started? Sometimes, for example, a, a student in chiropractic college may already be married. Can they treat their spouse? Or is that a violation of the sexual misconduct rules? Uh, I'll tell you in general the, the, not in general, I'll tell you the Texas rule doesn't address this situation. There is no exception. But I think there's at least a good faith argument that could be made that in this situation, there was no abuse of the doctor-patient relationship or no, the doctor did not take advantage of the doctor-patient relationship to initiate the sexual relationship. And the last question or possible defense on here is what if the 
doctor and patient live happily ever after. They wind up getting married. There's a mutually committed relationship or a long-term relationship. Is that an exception? There are a handful of states that have looked at that and have created some type of exception for that conduct. Texas is not one of those states. So I cannot tell you that there is an exception for either of these last two situations, even though there may be a good faith argument. Now, the other thing about happily ever after is, again, people don't file these complaints as long as they're happy. The complaints get filed in other situations when, when someone's heart is broken. So how do you protect yourself from sexual misconduct claims? Doctors need to establish and maintain boundaries in the doctor-patient relationship. Just real briefly, the boundaries are proper role of the doctor, time, place and space for treatment, exchanging gifts, appropriate clothing, treating family and friends, self-disclosure by the doctor, inappropriate physical contact by the doctor, uh, money situations, and language situations, or the language used by the doctor. Let's start by talking about the role first. Sometimes it's difficult for a young or a new chiropractor to understand that patients look to the doctor, they look to the professional to set the boundaries. What's appropriate in this doctor-patient relationship? Is it appropriate to flirt or not? Uh, and the doctor really sets the tone for that. The doctor needs to manage that doctor-patient relationship. And the role is very, very basic question. Is, is the doctor engaged in the appropriate conduct for a healer or a chiropractor? Is that what a, a healer or a chiropractor should be doing the way they should be conducting themselves with the patient? The second boundary is time. Ordinarily, doctors should be treating patients during regular office hours. You need to be careful about patients who want to come in before or after office hours. The patient may be seeking an inappropriate relationship, or it may be tempting to the doctor if nobody else is around, or more tempting to the doctor if no one is around to monitor what's going on. Uh, placing phone calls to the patient's home, certainly that's not a boundary violation. But placing phone calls later at night, uh, generally I would say it's never going to be appropriate to call a patient at home after 9 o'clock unless you're returning the patient's late call. Um, and it sends an inappropriate message. I would recommend you stick to the earlier hours like between 6 p.m. and 8 p.m. I think another part of the time boundary is the length of appointment. The time that a doctor spends with a patient should be appropriate for what the patient needs. But if the time being spent with the patient is being extended because the doctor is attracted to the patient, that's a warning signal to the doctor that maybe this doctor-patient relationship is not headed in the right direction. Place and space. Doctors should ordinarily treat patients at their office. Certainly, there's no rule against home visits, but a doctor needs to be aware that when they're seeing a patient at their home, they're vulnerable to claims. It's a good idea to be careful about those visits. If you choose to make them, uh, try to have somebody else with you, another employee or another member of your family, so that there's no argument or so that there's another witness besides you and the patient to what occurs. Uh, the other thing I'll warn you about home visits is the stories I hear from doctors who actually make those visits is many times when the patient thinks it's an emergency to receive their treatment, they don't think it's such an emergency to pay the doctor. Uh, place and space also has to deal with treating patients in social settings, at parties, on golf courses, or, or other social events. Ordinarily, it's not appropriate to treat patients in those situations. Uh, you're not going to provide good care for them. You're not going to provide an appropriate examination. You're probably not going to get good informed consent. And it's going to be very difficult to defend that, uh, that, that, that treatment if there's a malpractice or a complaint filed with the state board. Be careful about large gifts. Small gifts are okay. If a patient shows up with a plate of cookies for the 4th of July, that's not a violation. 
or if you give small gifts to patients, that's probably not a violation. Remember the discussion about the kickback rules earlier, though. Make sure they're truly small gifts. The problem is when a larger gift is being made from a doctor or a patient, and it seems like something may be expected back. Certainly, the doctor should never be making that kind of a gift to a patient. If a doctor happens to receive that kind of a large gift from a patient or valuable gift from a patient, the doctor needs to return it and explain to the patient that it's not necessary or appropriate in the doctor-patient relationship. Clothing applies to both the patient and the physician. Chiropractors need to dress in an appropriate manner for a professional in their community. Now, particularly for younger or newer chiropractors, I recommend that you observe the professionals in your community and try to dress as professionally as they do or perhaps a little bit better and help establish your credibility in that community. If you have your patients disrobe for uh, uh, examinations or for treatments, be sure you give them an appropriate place to change clothes and that it's a private place. As you conduct your examination or treatment, be certain that you keep them properly draped. If a patient arrives for an appointment and they're not dressed appropriately, for example, if a doctor is going to be providing a side posture adjustment and the patient is wearing a short skirt, uh, the doctor needs to think in advance to be prepared for that. Certainly one option is to tell the patient you're not gonna do the adjustment today and to uh, invite the patient to come back at another time when they're dressed more appropriately. I think another possibility, and, and quite frankly, I copied this from the school my daughters went to, when they violated dress code, not that they ever violated dress code, but when students violated dress code, uh, they would have to uh, wear a sweatsuit for the rest of the day at school. They wouldn't be sent home, they'd wear a sweatsuit that said dress code violation. Easy way to solve this problem in a doctor's office is to have some clean scrubs available so that if a patient is uh, uh, dressed inappropriately, you can provide them with a clean set of scrubs at an appropriate size and have them either put the scrubs on over their clothes or to change into the scrubs to perform the adjustment. And then you can explain to the patients how they can dress more appropriately in the future. What about using a chaperone? Having a patient, or not a patient, having a employee in the examination room while the patient is disrobed or exposed. I think it can be a helpful practice. I think a better way to handle that is instead of treating them as a chaperone, treat them as part of the process. The employee should be assisting you with the examination, uh, something like recording the examination results rather than just standing in the corner like a chaperone. I think it's a little less awkward if you involve them in the process that way. Treating family members and close friends. You need to think carefully about whether you're the best doctor for a close family member or a friend. One thing you'll discover when you graduate is that everybody who's in your extended family will expect free chiropractic care. You need to think about who you can treat for free and not treat for free, and you need to be careful about what conditions you are handling and whether you're really the appropriate doctor for handling that condition. You also need to think about whether the patient will comply with the doctor's recommendations. Imagine a situation where your spouse is having low back problems, and they're having low back problems because they're overweight. Do you really think the best advice is for you to advise the patient to lose weight and do you think it will be received very well by your spouse or do you think it would be better if that advice came from a different doctor who is not related to your spouse uh, are you willing to work with this patient to probe their intimate history if necessary and to bear bad news if necessary and can you be objective enough to provide appropriate care? Typically what happens when you first get out of school is you're more than happy to provide treatment for these patients, for these family members for free. But as your practice gets busy, uh, 
the treatment you provide for these family members tends to be less and less. So for example, instead of seeing your spouse when you're fresh and, and providing good treatment for patients, you'll see your spouse at the end of the day when you're exhausted. You make no record or very little record of the treatment. You perform no examination or very little examination, and you're just not providing good quality care for your spouse in that situation. And if it's even a close call, there's really a very easy solution to this situation. You're not the only chiropractor who has family members and friends who expect free care. There are other chiropractors in your community who also have family members and friends. It should be fairly easy to set up an exchange or a, a professional courtesy relationship with another doctor so that your family members and friends need to call that third person, that doctor who is an objective doctor, uh, to make an appointment, go see that doctor in their office, your family members and friends will take the advice, the treatment sessions more seriously. Uh, they're more likely to accept the advice as objective advice uh, and not tainted by that personal relationship. And if you have a, a relationship with, with a professional courtesy situation with another doctor, it's very easy for you to see their family members and friends on those same terms. Uh, and I think that works out pretty well in most situations. Next boundary is physician self-disclosure. Generally, when you're interacting with patients, you should be talking about the patient and their condition and their recovery, not about the doctor. Now, that doesn't mean you can't ever discuss the doctor's situation. If a doctor's treating a patient for a low back injury and wants to share with the patient that the doctor had the same type of injury and that's what inspired them to become a chiropractor, I think a brief mention of it is certainly okay. But an extended discussion about the doctor's own problems is not why the patient came to the doctor's office, and that's not part of the professional relationship. And certainly a discussion by the doctor about personal problems, fights with their spouses, or unhappiness with their spouse is not an appropriate discussion for a patient. Physical contact. Of course, physical contact is necessary to provide chiropractic care. But the physical contact needs to be appropriate contact and it needs to be provided with proper communication. Think about how you are going to touch the patient and whether you are touching the patient in an area that they may find offensive. Communicate why you are touching the patient, what you are doing before you touch the patient, communicate appropriately during the contact while you're performing a side posture adjustment is not probably the right time for a uh, inappropriate comment from the doctor. Be conscious of what you're doing and then communicate after the contact. Why did you touch the patient? What did you, you accomplish in touching the patient? Did you think it went well? I also think it's important as you develop as a professional to evaluate yourself after an interaction with a patient and think about how you could have handled it better. Now let's talk a minute about hugging your patients. I got to give you two answers to this question. I'm an attorney. My role as an attorney is to give you advice to minimize your risk. I got to tell you, to minimize your risk, the correct answer is you shouldn't hug your patients. The correct legal answer, I should say. Uh, bottom line is, is most professionals, very few professionals, hug their patients. How many people get hugged by their banker? How many people get hugged by their lawyer or their CPA or their dentist or their medical doctor? I've certainly been to my medical doctor and had visits where they barely even touched me at all, certainly didn't hug me. So it's just not part of our society where professionals hug patients. So that's my first answer as a lawyer. Now, my second answer is as someone who's worked with chiropractors for a number of years, and I know some of you are going to go hug your patients no matter what I say is the best legal advice. So let's think about that for a minute. Personally, I do think there is a good argument to be made 
And I think there's some truth to the idea that by showing your patients that you care about them by hugging them, you help your patients get better faster. I believe that. I think that's right. And I think if you are hugging your patients because it shows you care and because it helps them get better faster, then I think it's an appropriate hug. But think carefully about how you hug your patients, how long you hug your patients, and which patients you hug. If you want to hug your patients to make them feel better, but you only want to hug those patients that are of the opposite sex within a certain age range and a certain level of appearance, then that's an inappropriate hug. You also need to be careful about patients who are overly enthusiastic about the hug. Uh, perhaps you want to be careful that you hug your patients only in front of your staff members, so it minimizes the risk that the patient may feel an inappropriate uh, uh, intent behind the hug. Um, also pay attention to your patient's body language. Some people just do not like to be hugged. And if your patient is one of those persons, even though they may not verbally tell you, don't hug me again, they may send the message through their, their body language that being hugged makes them uncomfortable. It doesn't make any difference what the reason is for that. Perhaps it's a history of sexual abuse. Perhaps there's some other reason that they're just not comfortable being hugged by their doctor. Whatever the reason is, you should respect their wish and not hug that patient again in the future. Next boundary is money. Somebody actually did a study, and it's amazing what NIH will spend their money on sometimes. But what they found in this study is that before doctors committed sexual misconduct with patients, they would usually stop charging or stop collecting fees from those patients. So the warning here is that if you're not collecting or you're not charging a patient for your services, you need to ask why. If there's a legitimate reason, you're waiving your fees because the patient can't afford your fees, then that's certainly okay. But if you're waiving your fees because you think you might be interested in a relationship with the patient, then that's not okay and you need to, to, to transfer that patient to another doctor. If you engage in bartering with patients, make sure there's a very clear agreement about what value is being exchanged and how the services are being valued so that there's no argument down the road that somehow you were taking advantage of the patient and not bartering in a fair manner. By the way, also remember that any services or, or goods you receive as a result of bartering are considered taxable income and should be reported on your tax return. Final boundary is language. Think about the language you use, how you communicate with, you, with your patients. What words do you use? Now, at one extreme, it's easy when you've been studying chiropractic for years, it's easy to use very technical terms that patients don't understand. Use language that they can understand that's appropriate. Um, think about your tone of voice, uh, your volume. That can make a big difference in the message that you're communicating. And of course, body language. Sometimes we forget that it's not just the words that we use, but most of the communication that occurs between people is that body language and that tone of voice. Uh, be careful about or think about how you uh, look at patients. Leering is a complaint that sometimes comes up or looking a patient up and down. Um, certainly you need to look at your patients in order to examine them and, and treat them appropriately, but be sure you're looking at a, at a way that's professional and not a way that sends a message that you're uh, looking at them inappropriately. Uh, we talked earlier about referring to the girl in the office. Use that person's name so that it can't be misconstrued. Uh, there are some older people who use terms like honey, sweetie, and cutie to address every girl. Um, Again, don't use those terms of endearment. Use the person's name. I can't think of a situation where it would be appropriate to whistle at a patient. That just is a pretty clear boundary violation to me. So those are the 10 boundaries. Now, there's no law that says you have to follow those boundaries. The point of those boundaries is to, to, to 
manage that doctor-patient relationship so that the patient doesn't get the wrong idea about what the doctor is doing or why the doctor is doing uh, uh, something with the patient. The patient understands that it's a professional relationship and not something else. What happens when you break the rules? When the licensing boards receive sexual misconduct complaints, especially when they involve physical behavior, I think the licensing boards tend to impose the harshest penalties available to them. They don't think about written reprimands. They almost immediately go to suspension or revocation of the doctor's license. Part of the reason they do that is they think this conduct is highly inappropriate. It endangers the patients and it shows a doctor's lack of respect for the patients. In addition to possible disciplinary action from a licensing board, the doctor who engages in this kind of conduct exposes themselves to civil liability. The patient may sue the doctor for an inappropriate relationship. The uh, uh, damages in that kind of case are emotional distress and mental anguish. And it's possible that a jury may come back with a very large number for the value of those damages. Usually juries come back with large numbers if when they are, find conduct offensive. And I think jurors, just like the licensing boards, view sexual misconduct by a doctor as extremely inappropriate and extremely damaging and they're more inclined to send a message to the doctor that that was inappropriate conduct by finding a large number for the amount of damages. Doctor also runs the risk of criminal liability. Most states, including Texas, have a statute that says patients cannot consent to sexual relationships with their health care providers. Patients cannot consent to sexual relationships with health care providers, with their health care providers. If you are treating a patient and you engage in sexual misconduct or a sexual relationship with that patient, that's sexual assault because the patient cannot effectively legally consent to that conduct. And last thing is to think about your reputation. Even if you are found innocent, even if you don't aren't held liable, even if the licensing board doesn't take action against you. If you engage in inappropriate conduct, patients talk, especially in a smaller community. Everybody's going to know that you're the doctor who did something inappropriate with your patient. And it's going to make it very difficult to build your practice. It's going to make it very difficult to find patients at all. And if you doubt the effect of of how that impacts your, your reputation and your legacy. Just think about some of the people who've been in the news over the last few years uh, for their, their connection with sexual misconduct. Uh, first one there is Ken Starr, who was the president at Baylor University. Now, he wasn't personally accused of any inappropriate conduct or sexual misconduct, but he was accused of not investigating and not following up appropriately to protect the students at Baylor University. Think about that one for a minute, too. Remember, as a doctor, you're responsible not just for your conduct, but you're also responsible for the conduct of your employees. Be sure you train them appropriately and supervise them appropriately on their relationships with your patients. Of course, Bill Cosby has his issues, Jared from Subway. Uh, Coach Joe Paterno, like Ken Starr, was not accused of any sexual misconduct, but he was accused and his reputation was tarnished because he allowed uh, one of his assistant coaches to engage in inappropriate conduct with young boys. Uh, Bill Clinton, I think, needs no explanation. Uh, General Petraeus lost his position because of his relationship, extramarital affair. So bottom line of this is, is you want to stay away from this kind of conduct because it's a high risk behavior. You wanna make it very clear in your relationships with your patients that it's a professional relationship and not something else.